Hey gamers, Maniac here with GameAccess.net doing the next site podcast and this time we're going to be talking about The Dark Knight himself, Batman and the Arkham series of video games. The great thing about the Bat has always been that Batman is a timeless character. Uh, he's been around when he was originally, you know, for a long time, you know, since the 1930s. Created by uh, Bob Kane with the original stories made by Bob Kane and Bill Finger. And later on, in the years passing, well, let's face it, not only has there been comic books, there's been novels, there's been graphic novels, there's been several different animated series, several live action series, um, several movies, relaunches of movies, some of them considered some of the greatest movies ever made. He holds the title of World's Greatest Detective. Well, fictionally, of course. Um, Batman is a seminal character. And that's a testament to his creation. This is going to be kind of a bit of a different type of um, Game Access podcast because my intention is to kind of talk a lot about the history of this, but also my experiences with this. Now... There's tons of history that I can go over with for a Batman character, and I plan to. The thing is, though, this is a gaming site. This is a gaming podcast. I'm not going to try to give you, you know, I, I wouldn't want to tread on the, you know, tread on the toes of some classic, uh, you know, ga- you know, comic book uh, artists and, and, and famous comic book historians and stuff like that. You don't come to me for comic book information, you come to me for gaming information. I'm going to try my best to keep it in the realm of gaming, but I do think that some respect needs to be paid to the creation of Batman, so I'll try to keep it brief. For those of you who don't know, Batman was created by Bob Kane, a young Jewish man living in New York City, who was tasked basically to create a second superhero after the success of Superman. According to the documentaries that I have seen, Bob Kane was very inspired by um, the work of Leonardo da Vinci, and in particular Leonardo da Vinci's notebook. The famous um, glider that uh, Leonardo da Vinci had designed was made up of what looked to be bat wings. In fact, da Vinci had written down in the notebook that, um, remember, the wings should be that of a bat. So... When Bob Kane was looking at the character, and this is, of course, by his own admission, uh, when Bob Kane was looking at designing the character and looking for inspiration, he kind of wanted to do two things. One, he wanted to have a character that was almost the exact opposite of Superman. So instead of having the powers of Superman, he decided to have a mortal man do this, you know, to do this. And inspired by the work of Leonardo da Vinci's notebook and by that comment, The Wings of a Bat, he decided, I'll create a Batman. The rest is history. In fact, actually, if you look really closely, that inspiration has stunned, stayed in, uh, to this very day. I mean, I specifically remember seeing uh, a very similar looking glider to Da Vinci's glider in Batman Year One, for example. He, it was, you know, it was the, the inspiration is still is still there. Batman has used gliders like that in the past. So I thought that was really interesting. The Batman's history is very simple. A young, a young boy with very, very wealthy parents watches his parents murdered in front of his eyes. He decides that at that moment he was going to become the last victim of, of, of crime. He devotes his growing up, his entire growing up, um, into this whole uh, in, in investing his, his fortune into building himself up as the perfect... Um, crime fighter, basically. He trains his mind in all of new type of detective history and technology and um, forensics and things like that. He trains his body into being able to make nearly superhuman uh, feats of strength. He builds himself. He, he travels the world um, learning from the best masters he can find. Um, all of the different uh, strengths and, 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 and things he'll need about how to control his mind, how to, how to block out pain, how to be able to, um, uh, la- you know, stay, you know, endure beyond the human endurance. 
what are, what are the best, the most painful fighting styles that he could use to, you know, to harm people but not kill them. His intention was to stop crime, but to let the justice system make the decisions, not him. All he was going to do was determine guilt where it couldn't be determined and apprehend what couldn't be apprehended. But that was where he was going to end. That was that he was not an executioner. He did not want to be an executioner. And given the fact of his parents were killed by guns, he made the conscious choice not to use a gun. He would use other tools, um, to, to, including tools that he developed, but also common tools like knives and, and things like that, um, as assistance. And even though he was alone, when he started, he determined the fact of he was he was unable to by himself invoke the advantage that he needed when fighting. He knew he needed to make them fear him. He knew he needed to be feared. He needed to be seen as something more than he actually was. And it was determined in probably the more recent retcons and things like that that he chose the mantle of a bat because the bat was frightening. The bat was something that was scary. It can be taken as something that was he, – he could be perceived as something that was superhuman. Um, and he could have his revenge against crime. Over the years, new allies came to him. He had formed allies with others, um, like the chief of police, Jim Gordon. I'm sorry, the commissioner of the police, Jim Gordon, the chief of police, O'Hara, who is, actually was in the comic books, although he was in the comic books recently. <laughs> um, he was in uh, The Long Halloween, which was actually pretty awesome, but he got killed, sadly. But it was nice that they actually did put O'Hara in the comics. And um, he gave them the tools to contact him if need be, the signal, of course. And um, as he started operating, the criminals started trying to impress their tactics to one-up him. And new criminals started getting created as a response to his, to his actions. And, um, and Gotham is still trying to pick up, you know, is still trying to forge itself its own identity as he remains their protector. So that's the history of Batman in short, as vague and as short as I could make it. Um, hopefully I didn't miss anything too bad, but like I said, I did leave out some major gaps about history of his, of his things. It's really not important to, uh, to, to the Arkham series, certainly, at least for right now, to, to know the further expanded, you know, further knowledge. But that's, that's pretty much the gist of Batman. That's his history. That's his, that's his motivation. That's how he, if you really want to know the creation of Batman and the best way to, to see Batman when he was just, you know, starting up, um, I recommend Frank Miller's Batman year one book. You could totally read that. If you want to hear about, um, what it was like when he was starting off in Gotham. Um, if you're interested in seeing his training, or anything along those lines, of course, you can watch Batman Begins, uh, directed by Christopher Nolan. It was uh, the first movie in the Dark Knight series, which is uh, recent, which has recently been some of the most popular comic book movies of all time. So there is a subject matter already available. Now I know what you're saying to yourself. Um, if Batman was indeed so popular, why is it that um, it took this long to get some decent Batman video games? Well, let me try to explain this. Batman had appeared in video games for a long time. Batman was a property just like anything else, and he was a popular property. But just like with anything... You know how movie cash-ins and things like that are usually terrible? It's probably because the publisher or the developer paid all the money towards or um, basically getting the rights to it and then figured, well, we're, the people that are going to be buying this are not, are, are not going to be people that are – are just going to be people that are interested in this property 
and these are likely not going to be you know huge gamers or or or, or, or have high expectations and we'll just turn out a cut rate product as cheaply as we can to make up the difference for the fact we had to pay for this property it will be bought anyway and we'll be able to cut our losses and continue on with making with making garbage that's pretty much the same it's pretty similar to what happened with Batman however Every once in a while, a talented development house or a talented team would tackle a Batman game. And the common, but the common wisdom was, at least by the time of the aughts, or at least by the time of the, the year 2000 turn, that um, anything licensed was going to be bad. There, one exception at the time were going to be the Star Wars video games because LucasArts was making those, and that was, of course, a Lucas development house operating as the same company as what made the Star Wars films. So they were the they were the exception. People, you know, they could be there could be good Star Wars games, or the girls would be bad Star Wars games, but there could be good Star Wars games, but really not too much else. There wasn't really a good Star Trek game that people liked back then. Um, any major properties or any movie tie-ins were still were, were everybody was pretty much just avoiding them. There was never really good movie tie-in games that were happening. I know a lot of people really like 1989's um, Batman on the NES. I never played it. Um, but uh, a lot of people said that even though the game was probably well made, it was very difficult. I never played it, so I really can't say. But that was that's one I'm sure people are going to want me to bring up. Um, it was a retelling, basically, or, or like a, a game ad adaptation of um, 1989 Batman movie. It had a cool art style, I got to admit that. It had some very interesting gameplay mechanics that Batman could do. But it looked especially, it looked hard, like really, really, really hard, especially the final boss with the Joker battle. So that was that. Moving on, there were later Batman video games. I mean, there were games on the Commodore 64, there were games on the um, Super Nintendo... There, you know, some of them were side scrollers. Most of them were adapted from the movies. Very few of them were adapted from the comics. Batman Forever on the Super Nintendo was terrible, although it had a great jingle. <laughs> Watch my top commercials of all time video, or, and uh, to see that one. But uh, yeah. Anyways, what I really remembered enjoying quite a bit. And I think that a lot of people were interested in this was when they were finally starting to go away from the movie properties because after 1997, um, the movie properties were done. They were just they were just done uh, because there were no there were no more movies. And obviously, we we weren't going to see another movie until 2005, but we didn't know that. Um, with the big flop of Batman and Robin, um, there, you know, obviously there wasn't too much to play around with. There was a very successful animated series that was going on, but um, it really, the like the games that were developed for it were pretty much kind of like um, they were decent, but um, there were still it, they were you know there were still some things about it. In particular, they had interesting art styles, they had interesting gameplay, but they were still just fighting action games. There wasn't really anything about them that screamed the other aspects of what Batman could do. And I think that a lot of people, I, I, for me personally, I mean, they just didn't seem very interesting to me because um, even though the art style was interesting, they adapted the comic book style. Um, again, it just didn't scream Batman. It just, you know, it was Batman fighting with maybe Robin. It wasn't, you weren't doing the other things that Batman did, like detective work or... A investigation or stealth or anything like that. And then around 2000, I believe 2001, I started getting interested in this game that was being developed by Ubisoft uh, called Batman Vengeance. And that game interested me a lot because um, it was a 3D perspective Batman game that was adapted from the animated series. That immediately interested me. I really liked the animated series. I especially at the time liked the later seasons of the animated series where they changed up the art style. I kind of liked the newer art style. I think they were going for a more modern look over the original art style. I know that a lot of people will probably disagree with me on that. You're fine too. And right now, I don't, I don't feel that I don't share that 
uh, anymore. I don't. I, I think that they're both on equal footing nowadays. But um, I liked the at the time. I really liked the later art style, the more the, the more modern art style that they were going for the later season. And um, of course, I loved all the voice actors and actresses that that did that series as well. Mark Hamill as the Joker, and of course. Um, Kevin Conroy is Batman. Just amazing. Um, just, just amazing. So, Batman Vengeance originally came out to consoles. It did eventually get a PC release. I think the reason why it got a PC release was because the console versions were so successful that, um, you know, a PC release was, was merited. And because um, that happened every once in a while, if you had a really, 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 really financially successful console game, they would eventually get it to PC. Um, so I remember playing it and thinking, okay, this is it, it. It wasn't perfect, but it definitely had a lot to it. Uh, it had the great voice acting continue. It had a cool art style. I liked how they kind of adapted that original, like that later Batman animated series art style to 3D. In fact, actually, that art style was an uh, inspiration when the Justice League uh, television series started. They adapted, uh, or they should say that was the inspiration for how they did the opening um, credit sequence for the original seasons of the Justice League animated series. It was actually inspired by Batman Vengeance, his 3D art style. And... Um, I thought, okay, this is a this is a good step in the right direction. It wasn't perfect, like I said, but it was a lot. It, it was it was a lot of what I was expecting. It had an interesting story to it. It had like decent. It had great voice actors. It had a really cool art style, which was good for the time. There were some problems with it. Um, I didn't, you know, like the the, the vehicle sequences. I, I didn't like very much, but um, I'll, I'll, there, that's like not much to go into. Um, it, it had a cool mess of villains. It, the you know the Joker was in it, Harley Quinn was in it, Poison Ivy was in it, Mister Freeze was in it. Um, it was it was a decent game. It was a decent try. It wasn't perfect, but it was all right, and um, it was it was the best that I could have asked for. And then I started getting really interested in something else. Um, around this time, again, I was a through and through PC pl uh, gamer. I had I didn't have any of the consoles at the time, but a lot of people started talking about this game called um, Batman Dark Tomorrow. Now, this was a game that was announced that I think it was first shown at like an E3 basically, and they had a um, this was after Dark this was after Batman Vengeance. Um, and a lot of people became interested in it because of the initial trailers and teasers for it. We got to see Batman, we got to see a Batmobile, we got to see him fighting criminals, we got to see, we got to see an early look at the Joker. And I think that that game, when it was in development, got a lot of people very interested because of the art style. Here was a game that was intentionally trying to get back to the comic book roots of the series. And um, it was actually going to be as as ins very inspired by the comics. It was like a part of the co of the ongoing comic series. I wasn't reading the comics at the time, but I would later start reading the comics. And um, I really became interested in um, after the No Man's Land and in, in like the No Man's Land series and stuff like that. I, w I was like reading the graphic novels like clockwork. And. Um, all the, and it looked like it was taking place in that in that continuity, which was interesting, certainly. And I thought, well, here is an opportunity to see something we never really saw in a video game, which was a comic book adaptation of Batman. We could see all of the major villains that were out at the time, and um, not just the ones that you know, not just be restricted to what we saw in a movie or an art style that we saw in a movie. So very interested there. The game came out. Um, but not before doing some, um, oh, how do I put this? There, um, there was a huge, huge hype release for it. It was originally going to be a piece, I'm sorry, a PS2, Xbox, and GameCube game. The problem was, was that they had a problem adapting to the PS2 hardware from the original GameCube engine. They could get it on the, um, on the Xbox, but they couldn't, but basically the original development, the development platform for it was the GameCube. They had to cut a lot out in order to get on the Xbox. 
and they just didn't have the time to get it on the PlayStation 2. So at launch, they put it on the PS2 and the Game and the GameCube. The game was beyond awful, which is ext- probably one of the biggest gaming disappointments in all time. Um, obviously, there have probably been more popular ones, but this was at the time a huge, huge, huge disappointment. A lot of people were really invested in this game doing well. The it, people were really interested after the trailers came out. They thought this, this, they they released some of the CGI cutscenes that they had included. They had a great orchestra do the um, do the music. They had a great director do the. Um, it was one of the Final Fantasy directors, if I remember correctly. Um, direct the cutscenes. Um, a lot was pegging on this game of being a major game and probably bringing Batman back as a, as a viable video game property. Especially on the heels of Batman Vengeance, which people thought was a good stepping stone. Dark Tomorrow was practically unplayable. The gameplay was beyond shit. It was horrible. And the, the Xbox version was even worse. The GameCube version may have been absolutely terrible. Actually, both versions may have been absolutely terrible on a gameplay perspective. But at the very least, the, the GameCube version had some things going for it. In particular, it had collectibles. It had a cinematic viewer. It, had, uh, it basically had some things going for it, uh, basically. Wasn't all absolutely terrible. Uh... You just had to play through the game. <laughs> that was that. But I thought the the story was interesting. I thought the cinematics were well made. I thought the CGI was great. Um, I thought they nailed the atmosphere uh, in the in the arenas and stuff like that. The problem was it didn't. It just the gameplay mechanics were completely broken. You had to do ten different steps in order to throw a bat rope. Um, and if you missed or if you made a mistake, you, you know, you die instantaneously. And in fact, that was like one of the first parts of a first level was you're going from rooftop to rooftop. You had, you, you, the game didn't really explain to you well how the bat rope works. And it was, it was terrible. To say nothing of the fact of the fighting system was broken. Blocking didn't work very well. Dodging was was it was all right, but the the fighting system was bad. Basically, everything about this game, short of the story and the art style, was bad. The gameplay was bad. Uh, you, it was impossible just to navigate. You know, pathfinding actually was difficult, knowing where you were because of the perspective change all the time. The camera wouldn't follow you around very much. It would constantly be shifting perspective, and because of that, you'd constantly be getting turned around. You had a radar on the screen. In fact, actually, they added a little line that showed you where you had been and where you were going. Uh, But uh, if you looked at a normal gameplay segment, you'd be constantly, be constantly turned around. If only the camera could have followed you or something, you wouldn't have been getting lost. So there was that. You got to you get to see some cool enemies, though. I mean, you got to see some enemies you really hadn't seen in a video game at this point. It was the first time I ever got exposed to Mr. Zaz, for example. Um, it was the first time I, you know, we got to see like the Rat Catcher was in there, Scarface and the Ventriloquist was in there, Black Mask had an appearance, and of course, um, well, let's face it, uh, Mr. Freeze, uh, Poison Ivy, Killer Croc, uh, the Joker, and I think the first time we ever saw a uh, Raisha Ghoul and, and uh, Ubu in a game. If only that game was better. You know, if only there was a better game that you could have put these characters in. And that's when Arkham City was announced. <laughs> okay, then several, uh, that's, that's an unfair statement for me to make. And several years later, Arkham City gets announced. <laughs> so after all of that, let's talk about the Arkham games. As I said, the Batman games pretty much went south, and I don't think a lot of people were too interested in them around the time of Dark Tomorrow's release. I think a lot of people probably remember Rise of the Sun Tzu as this really, really bad game that probably nobody wanted to replicate. But 
they don't remember that Vengeance came before the Sun Tzu, and actually Sun Tzu was a sequel to Vengeance because Sun Tzu was, or Sin Tzu, or I, don't, I forgot how it's pronounced, but it was, um, it, that was the sequel to Vengeance, and again, that was another bad one. I don't think anybody was very interested in making Batman games after that. So here came this developer called Rocksteady, who released a trailer sometime around 2009, and it, all it was was just a little teaser showing a camera going through their Arkham environment. Now, anybody who's familiar with Batman is familiar with Arkham Asylum. That's where all the supervillains and the super criminals go to um, basically where they go before they can escape and go wreak havoc. <laughs> That's where Batman puts them, right? It's supposed to be a hospital. There's been a lot of talk about it. Um, there have been graphic novels devoted to it. What it was, what its history was, it's always been up in arms. But to a lot of people, it, because this is something that could hold all of these dangerous individuals, it became something almost romantic-like. Now, this, isn't the, this wasn't the first time Arkham Asylum was visited in the video game. Um, the final, or one of the final areas of Dark Tomorrow actually took place in Arkham Asylum. In fact, that was where the majority of, um, uh, the villains that Batman had to fight his way through were. They were in, um, they were in, Ar they were in Arkham Asylum. That's where he faced, uh, Killer Croc, Mr. Freeze, um, Poison Ivy, Mr. Zazz, and finally the Joker. So... Here came this game, and we got to see the environments. That was the first thing we saw from Arkham Asylum. And it was interesting. We didn't see too much, but it definitely looked interesting. And then the first full-size trailer came out for it. And everybody kind of thought this was something special. At least I certainly did. They kind of started showing off Batman. They started showing off the environment. They established what the story was going to be. Batman is bringing the Joker back. The Joker's done some terrible things, but he's probably got some plans. Maybe he wanted to get inside Arkham and take it over or something like that. It looked like, and this is all one night, and you'll be able to explore Arkham Asylum, and you'll be able to you know, use Batman's gadgets to investigate Immediately, I think that people who knew Batman kind of thought, you mean to tell me that they're actually doing Batman right for the first time? You mean to tell me that we'll be able to make use of the Batman's abilities and we'll be able to fight the villains and the Joker's in there and there's going to be other villains and all of this other stuff? And I think some people were kind of skeptical that it would be good or... Would be would kind of like maybe holding off their, you know, kind of holding off their opinion until the game came out, um, and then they started announcing well who was going to be in the game. They had gotten the the cast of Batman the Animated Series were applicable. Kevin Conroy was going to be returning. Mark Hamill was going to be returning as the Joker. Um, I can't remember the actress's name off the top of my head. So gonna, sorry. Uh, I can't, I can't remember if uh, the voice of Harley Quinn was coming back, or I, Arlene Sorkin, I think is her name. Um, yeah, she was coming back, and basically, so basically not only are we having this whole new environment, but we've got a voice cast that we recognize that has universally been considered some of the best, you know, voice cast for this genre, um, for the Batman series, saga, um, and so that was perfect casting immediately, at least as, as far as I was concerned. Uh, the environments looked great. The, the graphics looked great. They were using the Unreal Engine. Everything was kind of stacked up for this thing to have a lot special for it. And uh, sometime before the game came out, uh, some people in PlayStation Home noticed they were seeing ads in PlayStation Home with the Joker's face on it, which was uh, for demonstration of the game. What had happened was was that uh, they were the the ads had said that um, the Joker was going to be playable, but only for the PlayStation Three version of Arkham Asylum. So I think that was like 
they said, okay, what is this? Is this true? And they finally confirmed it. Yes, it was true. The, the ads were jumped a little bit. I think they were pushed ahead before the development wanted them to, but it did get out. And, um, and they said, yes, there will be exclusive playable Joker missions, uh, but only for the PS3 version. So immediately the demand for the PS3 version came high. They also announced that they were doing a collector's edition, which was going to include a Batarang, um, uh, some uh, notebooks, in-universe notebooks, um, and a DVD documentary, as well as some downloadable content, plus downloadable content for deals, for pre-orders, basically. So, a lot of stuff coming in. As for further casting... Uh, the famous voice actor Wally Winger announced that he was going to be in the game. Um, people may know uh, Wally Winger as being one of the tallest, almighty tallest in Invader Zim. At least that's where I recognized him from. Um, he is a very famous voice actor who has done numerous roles, more than I can mention here on this podcast, so I, I really won't go into it. But for me, I really liked him as the, as the voice of one of the tallest. Um, that's that that was that was for me but if he said he was going to play the riddler in the game we didn't know there was going to be a riddler we didn't know the riddler was going to appear in the game um at that point but uh so we were like okay why would wally winger lie but then again why why we didn't know there was going to be the Riddler, and uh, the producer, the production did come through and say yes, uh, the Riddler. We did get, we did get, it is Wally Winger, and uh, you'll see what we have in store for him later. And so that's that also happened. And uh, <laughs> and then the game came out. Batman: Arkham Asylum was released in, I think it was two thousand. It was 2009 or 2010. Um, I think it was 2009 for the PlayStation 3, a Xbox 360, and the PC. A demo was released of it first, which was kind of the opening sequence of the game. So I think immediately some people knew that there was going to be something special about this immediately based upon the demo. The demo was amazing it was a great introduction to the story so the game comes out and you pl I played through the demo uh, sequence and it continued on with some other sequences that were added and then there was a moment very early on when I started playing it that I felt like I was Batman there was, I, 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 I don't know if it was immediate or I don't know if it was when I just started screwing around with what he could do, but everything that he could do felt seamless. He could leap onto rooftops, he could sneak around, he could investigate uh, crime scenes, he could track down stuff, he could, he could fight fant fantastically, he could fight large groups of enemies. Um, it just all felt right. It just everything just felt right, and everything felt like this is what Batman. This is what being Batman was like. This is what it was like to, you know, this. Ju it just felt right, and um, yeah. And then you got to make it outside that one building that you were in, and you're looking at the other buildings on you know through the island. And immediately it becomes clear to you that this is one. This isn't just one series of rooms. This is entirely, practically an open world environment, basically, where you'll be able to roam through all of the, you know, the entire city or the entire the entire asylum. It's completely open, and you know some sequences are locked off, but um, but but it's almost like Metroid, for example. It's like Batman is on Metroid or something. That was great. That was that was I think the way you could have done it. That was like the best way they should have done it. And they 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 were right to do it. The art direction was great. The um the riddles were fun. Um there were a lot of there were also a lot of uh, odd uh bits in it. Um I know that a lot of people probably complained a bit about the um the boss fights in particular with the game. 
um, that not too many of them were actually interesting. Um, they were, but they were presented well, I thought. Um, uh, I'll, I'll go into that a bit later. I don't really want to describe the whole story for it, but basically it's this. Um, the Joker is taken back to Arkham Asylum one night after raining havoc on um, Gotham City. Batman knows that something is wrong, so he goes with the Joker into the asylum to make sure that everything is transferred properly. Immediately, the Joker gets out with the help of Harley Quinn, who's already in the asylum, and while free, he's basically able to wreak havoc on the asylum and to use his plans, which is to take this new compound called Titan, and which is basically Bane's venom modified practically on steroids, basically, or perfected or whatever you want to call it. And wreak, and just basically wreak havoc. There are other um, villains in the asylum as well that have their own agendas, like Mr. Zaz, Poison Ivy, um, Killer Croc, and the Scarecrow, as well as the Riddler, who basically are going to use this. Some of them are not part of the Joker scheme, but basically, given the chaos in the asylum, will use the um, the, the Joker's you know, basically what the Joker is doing as a way to get their own um, piece back at Batman. I think it's probably most noticeable what the Joker, I'm sorry, what the Riddler and Scarecrow did. Um, the Scarecrow used the um, used his gas in the environment um, basically to uh, cause fear, and there were some great boss fights actually with the Scarecrow in that sequence. I think those were some of my favorite sequences in the game. The Riddler... Uh, was hiding collectibles and other riddles throughout the environment as well, expecting Batman to find them, or, or, or hoping to foil Batman's attempts to find them. Um, Batman, on the other hand, used finding these riddles as a way for um, him to get the Riddler captured, or to pull a trace on the Riddler's transmissions, and, um, and trace, his, um, trace his location and send him to jail. They have the police pick him up. Bane, his agenda was he wanted to get back at the doctor who had um, taken his formula and uh, made it into something terrible and practically tortured him. As for um, Harley Quinn, well, she was basically doing what the Joker wanted, but... You know, she's like BFFs with her, with uh, Poison Ivy, and she decided to let Poison Ivy out so she could spend some time with her flowers. And the po and Poison Ivy really didn't have an agenda of her own, except that um, the plants were kind of being affected by the use of the Titan formula, which were was affecting her. And um, in the end. Batman faces down the Joker. He faces down the Joker's men. The Joker injects himself with a Titan formula. Batman defeats him in a stunning battle. The Joker is given an antibody to the Titan formula, which leaves him very badly disfigured and scarred um, and in pain. And um, Arkham Asylum is marked safe for the night. I believe, though, that Two-Face decides at the very end of the night to rob a bank. And Batman uses his Batwing in order to uh, go investigate that. And the, uh, the reason why he had to use his Batwing was because he wrecked, one of the bat he wrecked his Batmobile, driving it into Bane. <laughs> it was a great game. It was a lot. It was great. It was great in a lot of respects. It was great because it felt like the closest thing we'd ever get to an open world Batman game. You can explore all of the island. The art style was phenomenal. The graphics and performance was great. All of the abilities that you'd think Batman would be able to have and use were at your disposal. The art style of Batman and all the villains worked great, very much in the comic book uh, style. Although they did say that the game is in its own continuity, it is not the continuity of. Um, of the comic books, although it was heavily inspired by the comic books. Um, as far as I'm concerned, that was like the best art style that you could go for. That was that I, I thought they did a great job actually of doing that art style, producing that art style. Um, 
I thought at the very end of the game, um, they do tease that uh, there is some Titan formula left over. And there are three possible endings, and they're, I believe, totally random, where the Scarecrow takes some Titan, Bane takes some Titan, and Killer Croc takes some Titan at the very end. Um, and we don't know what happens to either of them after the end of that game. Um, I think that after that, a lot of people were kind of saying, you did it. You finally did it. And it was considered to be probably, when it was released, the best Batman game ever, or the best superhero game in general ever released. It was that good. It reviewed that high. The critics loved it. The people who bought it loved it. Um, there were some great deals, like I said. Um, I would imagine, that obviously, the PS3 version of that game was the best version, by no doubt, because it had the Joker, down, it had the Joker levels. Um, those were never released to the, to the Xbox 360 or the PC. The PC version actually had a pretty fun um, copy protection on it that I liked um, from what I've been told, uh, from what I read on the forums and stuff like that. If the game was pirated, Batman couldn't jump or glide, which meant that uh, anybody calling in for technical support, immediately they knew he was a pirate or she was a pirate and uh, banned them. That was kind of funny, I thought. So, I thought that there was, you know, when it came to what they were doing, there was no, you know, there was no better, there was just no better way to do it. At least for, you know, you could, it was a great start for hopefully what would have been a large franchise. Um, there were tons of nods in there to all different kind of stuff. The Calendar Man cell was in there. You could tell because the pages were all over the place. Calendar Man, of course, everyone loved him from the long Halloween. Um, the, uh, there was other stuff like, um, you could see Mr. Freeze's Sal, you could, you know, even though he wasn't in there. Um, uh, it was great. It was a great game all around. Uh, there was some downloadable content released, um, later on. It was all free. They later took the included DLC that was included with, like, the, um, special edition and the, um, and the pre-order stuff, but they charged for that. Which was fine because if you already had bought it, there was no reason to buy it again. Or I should say, if you already had the download codes for it, there was no reason to, die, to buy it again. The Joker con content was also DLC, but that was also a free download as well. So, all in all, it was a great game that was I thought had a really great release way. It, it released in a, in a very good way. There was, it wasn't a lot of DLC, and what was released was free. Um, it had some cool exclusives for, for one particular platform. It was easy to pick out which version you wanted. It had a great collector's edition. The Batarang, I, I don't know how I feel about the collectible Batarang. I didn't like that it was made of plastic. Um, and it was scratched very easily. But um, I liked the included documentary on the Blu-ray disc that was included with it. I wish that um, game... I think that was like the last game I can think of that actually included a behind-the-scenes documentary with it. Um, I don't think any of the other ones... I don't think any other games did or have ever since. Um, pretty much everybody is just not releasing collect, you know, DVDs, behind-the-scenes DVDs with their, um, with their collector's editions anymore. They're releasing either books or just big collectibles. Um... I miss those days where you can have a great, well-produced documentary included with a behind-the-scenes look at um, at a game and, and get that with the collectible with the collector's edition. I miss those kind of days. So moving on, Arkham Asylum is a huge hit. It's considered like the best video game ever, best superhero video game ever. It was. You know, it was well made. It did a lot of. It had a lot of hats, but it was paid respect to all of the Batman mythos as well as a, being a great game. Um, every, voice actors were great. It was a good. It was great. I can't rave about it enough. So everyone immediately starts assuming what is it that they can do next, and I think that a lot of people assumed immediately that, well, what would be coming next would be a Gotham City game, wouldn't it? I mean, like here they were saying like. You could take it an Arkham Asylum as like a stepping point, and you could basically have all the abilities that Batman had in Arkham Asylum. Imagine how that would transfer over to an open world city, like you know something in Grand Theft Auto or something, where you'd be able to play as Batman in an open world environment. 
everybody it's like you could have all different kinds of villains you could have all these different kinds of um you could have more villains you could have more uh story you could have a bigger environment more joker riddles all this other kind of stuff the possibilities were po were endless with a, with the with, and people wanted it people were like these these abilities already would transfer over pretty well to a full game let's spin the dice and let's let's do a you know like a larger environment but they weren't talking the developers weren't talking and then Rockstar study did start talking. And they said that, um, and, and basically a new game was announced that was in the Batman Arkham Asylum um, universe. And they showed it by doing a very cool teaser trailer, which showed a larger Arkham environment. Like a very large Arkham environment. And they tease the Joker very, very sick from the effects of Titan. Like very ill in a wheelchair, wheezing and coughing and, and badly, badly disfigured. And all they said was, the big tagline was, Arkham has moved. That was the tagline. And the speculation started. <laughs> and I think immediately people were talking about, in fact, actually there was no name. Rocksteady didn't have a name for it. I think that um, eventually what happened was they actually had a letter writing campaign or some other type of seri uh, just a contest where you could name the game. And I think that the name ended up uh, being selected as Arkham City, if I remember correctly. Or maybe that somebody else picked up a name and they just decided to call it Arkham City anyway. I don't remember which. And then the around the time of the game... Um, I believe it was the game, uh, the Spike VGAs. They showed um, another teaser trailer, but this time a, a pretty good one. And um, it was all pre-rendered, but they showed who was going to be the main baddie of the game, and that was going to be um, Doctor Hugo Strange. Now, I have known Doctor Hugo Strange because, trust me, there's been plenty of art. Uh, Batman comic books and graphic novels with him as a villain in it. But as far as I knew, Hugo Strange was dead. Apparently he was, and he's just like, it's a running gag in the series, he's really good at faking his death, basically. The big thing about Hugo Strange was, and they used it in the, in the, in the game, was that Hugo Strange knew that Batman was Bruce Wayne. He knew it. The way he knew it was, he put two and two together, basically. He was the one who was able to do that. But I think that he determined that this knowledge was something that he should have kept to himself. And he did. He has kept it to himself. And he does it in the, and he does it in the game. So at this point, all eyes were pretty much looking towards E3 for any further information about the game. At this point, Rex Steady really didn't show too much. Like we knew that Hugo Strange was going to be the big baddie. We knew the Joker was going to be involved with Harley Quinn. We knew it was going to be in what looked to be a bigger environment. But we didn't know too much else other than that. There were some previews that were going around and things like that for um, just to show what the new concepts were going to be. There were preview, early previews coming out where they showed Batman gliding around the city and that they were enhancing the gliding ability so he could redirect momentum, which I honestly don't think would actually work in real life. I've seen you know gliders. I, I don't think you can actually... I don't think that actually works. I think people try doing that. It just, it, yeah, I don't think, I don't think that works well in a for for a glider. Um, I don't know why not, but I don't believe that it actually can be redirected like that, or at the very least, that it would you wouldn't be able to get as much momentum if you were to use a glider and then drop and then try to redirect yourself to propel forward. I don't think that's actually possible in real life. However, um, grapple boosting, we saw that also. Don't know if that's possible either, <laughs> uh, but he's Batman, so we'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. So these early previews were coming out, and they already were talking about the fact of not only would you be able to explore the larger environment, but you'd also but the Joker would be leaving clues all over. And unlike in the first game, 
which would have maps all over the place where the Joker would keep his riddles or answers, uh, keep his keep the answers to his riddles or keep you know the locations of his riddle trophies around. Um, you'd have to find informants, and the Bat Cow would uh, tell you. Um, it, they'd be in basically groups with other people, and all you would have to do was, you know, defeat the rest of the group and uh, get the get the informant and interrogate him, and he'd you know he'd let some information out. And that's ba- and that you know and and that's basically what we got for early talk about the game. At least we had some idea down about gameplay. Um, they were obviously saying the Joker had been affected by Titan. They were not letting completely out of what was coming villain wise. But the game, but people were doing gameplay previews, and it all looked fascinating to start off with. And then E3 happened. Now, I was at E3 2011. It was the first E3 I had gone to in years and the last E3 I've been to since. But um, Batman Arkham City was, for, was, was a major showing there, had a major showing there. And I specifically remember uh, checking out the, um, the, Batman, uh, the Batman Arkham City uh, booth and it just being a very long, very slow going line. In fact, actually, I wanted to check it out. It was recommended to me after I checked out the Darkness 2 panel. Uh, I'm sorry, the Darkness 2 booth. After I previewed that, I, um, I went for it to go see Arkham City. That was on uh, the first day of E3. Now, when I was... Um, the reason why I checked it out was not just because I was personally invested in... Um, and seeing it, I was. But um, some friends that I was staying with were also very vested in Batman. They were huge Batman fans, and I wanted to get back and tell them everything that I had seen. And um, it was at E3 that year that they finally broke news that um, Catwoman was going to be playable. Now, Catwoman wasn't even in the first Arkham Asylum game. But I think there was a little Easter egg in one of the back of the cinematics that she was mentioned, so we knew she kind of existed, as well as a few other guys. Um, there were a bunch of people that were listed, of course, that were not um, that were not seen in the game, but we knew they were there. Clayface, uh, we never battled him in the first game, but we knew he existed, of course. Uh, Mr. Freeze, of course, we never saw. The Calendar Man, who we never saw, but we knew he existed. Um, Catwoman was one of them. And they released a trailer at E3, which showed... Catwoman first and for you know front and center battling bad people and it was designed to show just how differently that Catwoman would be fighting that she would use her feminine aerobatics differently than Batman was that she was faster than Batman but her attacks did less damage but she wasn't again you know she wasn't around you know kissing a uh, kissing a bad guy while she was fighting them to make him you know make him you know make him go weak in the leg so she could knock him out great way to fight <laughs> Um, and of course also we saw her using her whip and her bolas and everything else, which are signature weapons that she uses in the comics. Um, uh, like the costume, um, like the fighting style from the trailer, um, I admit though the first time I saw that trailer it was actually while I was in line at the event and I didn't know if that meant yet, if that actually meant that it was, that she was playable. It looked like she was playable in the, uh, in the trailer, but there was no audio I could hear, um, that wasn't a problem with the booth. I either think that was either intentional. I just it was just drowned out by the other um, by the other booths. But I don't remember hearing any audio saying that she was in fact playable. But I so I just thought, well, it's nice that uh, that Catwoman is in the game. It, it certainly I I could I couldn't tell much further than that. So after over an hour of waiting to go see the game, I um, I got in on the preview with um, the Rocksteady developers, and the first thing we saw was uninterrupted live gameplay of playable Catwoman. And they showed us a sequence in the game, which wasn't the final version of the game, but they got to it differently. And the early previews that I had seen were that um, Batman and Catwoman's um, storylines would be uh, not interchangeable, but um, that you'd be able to uh, swap in and swap out of the story um, by your own choice. That was changed in the final version of the game, but that might have just been for demo purposes. In the final version of the game, you can swap between Batman and Catwoman, but only after the game's story has been completed. Um, 
So the first thing that we actually saw was what became Catwoman's third mission when she's investigating the, sa uh, the, the vault. She's trying to get into the vault for Poison Ivy, which immediately said, okay, Poison Ivy is going to be in the game. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> so they let that cat out of the bag, but that was intentional, I guess. And we got to see playable Catwoman. I think that was a really good mission that they used um, – to, to, do, to, to preview to the press exactly how different that Catwoman can stick to ceilings and uh, she's, she, she can do different special uh, you know, jump attacks and, and pounce attacks and stuff like that. And she fights differently than Batman, but, uh, it's, but it's cool in that respect. And I remember coming out of that demo thinking, wow, that's pretty awesome. And then after the demo concluded, the press was treated to a little bit of a special... Uh, special thing just for us in the in the room um, and that they hadn't announced publicly and was even though that Catwoman trailer was out and I guess people who watched the trailer knew that the Catwoman was playable this was something that we had seen that we were going to see that was not um, that nobody was going to see that nobody else was going to see and we're going to be given some little tidbit of information that was unique to us and he showed us they showed us the segment um just when Batman was about to battle all of the all of the Penguin's men, when uh, Batman was investigating the um, the museum, and the Penguin shows up with a very Cockney accent, and Batman ends up fighting like over thirty of the of the Penguin's men. Now we had not no we had no idea that the Penguin was going to be in the video game, so this was like a huge huge moment that we were being previewed. And of course, it is in the final version of the game. The one difference being that um, they actually censored a line that Batman said, and it wasn't because of uh, foul play. But I actually thought that the line was uh, "Please release Beep and the hostages." And I'm thinking that he's going after Catwoman. But I thought to myself, if he was going after, it kind of looked like his mouth was saying Catwoman. And I thought, well, if we just saw Catwoman, why, um, why are they censoring? We already know Catwoman is in the game. And then I thought, no, in all likelihood, he's asking for somebody else that we don't know yet is in the game. And it turned out when I played the final version of the game, much you know, it was a couple of months later, they had censored the word Mr. Freeze. And we didn't know that that wasn't told to us that Mr. Freeze was going to be in the game. So that was a nice... Um, so they, they kept that from us. But we did know that Penguin was going to be appearing. I remember when I came in, I recognized the I recognized what seemed like I recognized the actor or the voice actor that did it. Um, but I couldn't quite put my name put my put a, my finger on who was the actor. I, but there was just something very familiar with the voice. It turned out to be it was Nolan North doing a very Cockney accent. I I never would have guessed that. But you know, it makes sense. Nolan North does have a lot of uh, video game credits to his name. He has a, you know, he's, a, he's done a lot of video games. He's not just the voice of Drake from Uncharted Drake's Fortune. He's also the voice of, um, he also did the voice of uh, uh, Sergeant Forge from Halo Wars, a bunch of other characters um, in video games. So it's a, you know, it's a common voice to hear. That's probably why my ear recognized it. But because he was doing a Cockney accent, I couldn't quite place it was him. I'm sure Nolan North would be happy to know that. So I, that's you know just a testament to how well he can, I guess, pull an accent or or disguise his voice if he wishes to. So there you have it. Although I do think that if I remember correctly, uh, Nolan North did also voice a few henchmen as well, and you could tell that was Nolan North. So um, if I remember correctly, I do think I might have heard a, a Nolan North henchman during the Catwoman fight, but that could have just been my imagination. So that was the E3 showing, and I could, you could be sure that I was telling my friends um, all about that event and uh, about what I had seen. They'd also shown off some of the toys that were coming out. Gotham City Imposters also had a showing, um, and it was playable. There were also some people that were actually playing the game and demo units. From what I look, from what it looked like, they were playing at least what appeared to be playable at the demo. I didn't get a chance to to play them directly because I think that was a separate line. But uh, there were some playable demo units with what looked to be the opening sequence of the game for Catwoman. Now, I say the opening sequence of the game for Catwoman, and you're probably going to say, but that is the opening sequence of the game. And it is, but it's, it's not included in any version that doesn't have the Catwoman DLC or Catwoman um, content installed. Um, I really disagreed with the fact that they cut that game up and, and shipped Catwoman as separate DLC, even though it was free for... Um, 
for the uh, for anybody who bought the game brand new. It was pretty much a terrible, terrible, terrible cop out to um, cut those sequences out and uh, make people either buy the game new or um, or uh, or pay eight hundred points for for the DLC. I, it seemed to me like. Um, anybody paying for that uh, should have been entitled to that because that was an integral part of the of the game's story. So there's that. There was other stuff they could have given out for people that they could have given out a special I don't know costume or something like that. There was other stuff they could have given out for people who bought the game new. They could have given out any of the costumes or they could have done different costumes. There were there was other stuff. They could have done a special like. Um, room like a challenge room or a battle room or something like that they could have done that too but they chose to cut out a good portion of or like a fourth of the game basically and release it as dlc that was that i disagreed with that but that's neither here nor there Let, um, let's move on um ironically enough at the time my friend was actually editing one of his movies now i don't really want to go too much into this because this is not super super personal but it is kind of personal and i really don't want to go into it that much um but my friend was in the process of editing a movie while and i was actually part you know contributing to that edit um while telling him about all the batman stuff and needless to say if you knew who my friend was and what he was working on at the time um, it was pretty cool that I had all this to say to him, uh, all this Batman stuff to, to say to him during the process of the edit. And, uh, because of that, I, I don't, uh, because of my help possibly, or just because I was there or because maybe because I was a friend, but I did, I do feel like I helped a little bit, you know, contributed a little bit, um, and gave some, gave some, inf you know, ideas for the edit. Um, he had already shot the film by that point, so I couldn't contribute to the shooting, but I, you know, I did give some ideas. During edit, I am credited in his in that film that he had worked on, and I was really I was under special thanks. I appreciated that, so thanks a bunch. For, uh, thanks a bunch, bud. Um, so that was E three. Very good, very good showing. Certainly, um, that was the first time I really had seen the game playable. So definitely impressed with that. After that, um, the next major showing that they had done. I think the game was coming out in. September or October, I think it was October of, of 2011, just before that um, the game got released, maybe about a week or two before the game got released, the last preview that they had done was at 2011's New York Comic Con. Now, um, New York Comic Con was basically the first Comic Con I had ever gone to. I've never been to a San Diego Comic Con, and I was, ironically enough, interested in the, San Di in the New York Comic Con because... They had, um, because 2K had announced that they would be doing a Darkness 2 showing there. And that's how I first got exposed to the fact of the New York Comic Con happening. I checked the site, I submitted my press credentials, and they sent me a very nice email letting me in that year. And uh, props to New York Comic Con for letting me in, of course. So I'm going to, I, I, I set up and, and everything for the New York Comic Con uh, to preview the Darkness 2 plus whatever other games are going to be there. And one of the games that they had shown in one of the press panels, which I was there for, was Batman Arkham City. Now, let me just give a quick little summation of that panel. Um, Arkham City owned a good portion of that Comic-Con. And I'll tell you why. One was they had pretty much the victors, the, no, not uh, the, um, oh, what do you call it? The, the, um, the, the Hugo, the Dr. Hugo Strange trailer that I described at the very beginning of the, uh, of this talk, um, was basically playing on a loop outside the uh, the comic cons they had this huge led or lcd um screen near the convention uh, basically on the convention center's uh sign and right below that they could run you know previews or trailers or information on what's going to be what's showing and one of the things that they were running on that loop was the victor's i'm sorry i keep calling him victor's as is hugo strange was the hugo strange trailer which looked great it was great to see that um, so that was that was really refreshing. I had never been to that convention center before. I heard great things from my uncle who used to live in New York and was very happy. It was hosted at the Yarvitz Center, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, in uh, New York City. Uh, beautiful, beautiful center. Uh, beautiful convention. A lot of fun to attend to. Uh, a lot of fun. And... Um, and that was... The new, and, and, and one of the first panels that they had on that... I think it was on that Friday was the Batman Arkham City panel. 
Now, let me describe to you just briefly who was there. Now, they did have some team members from Rockstar in attendance. They also had Kevin Conroy. If you bring Kevin Conroy to a Comic-Con, that panel is going to fill up. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> that They also had the lead singer from Soundgarden there. I forget the man's name off the top of my head, but definitely really nice guy. He's the guy with the long hair, the long wavy hair. I can't remember the man's name. He's the front runner for Soundgarden. Great guy. I know I'm ashamed to say I don't remember his name. I've actually been to a Soundgarden concert, and I don't know the guy's name. I know his music, and he did a great, tr great track for the Arkham City soundtrack, an absolutely phenomenal track. And I don't remember the guy's name, but I think it's Chris something or other. But uh, yeah, the, the guy from Soundgarden was there because he had just released a new single for Arkham City, and they were giving that out uh, to a select group for the uh, select few people at the panel. Um, they also gave out that soundtrack for digital download for anybody who had. Um, uh, bought the collector's edition of the game, but I'll get into that later. Um, like I said, there were also Rockstar guys that were there. Um, and the guy, Crawl, the, the famous journalist, the famous gaming journalist, who I, was moderating the panel. And I've seen the guy moderate other panels, and he's awesome. He's really a, a really, I would call him a people person. I really would. He's definitely like a, a very social person. Has He brings a great energy to his to his events, and he's a great moderator for a lot of these things. So, Nagai, thumbs up to you. So, he was the one hosting the, th uh, the, the event. The cool thing was, was not only that you had this huge, you know, deus in attendance, basically. They showed... A good segment of the opening portion of the game, a part that we had never seen before. It was pretty much the opening in the steel mill, when Batman infiltrates the steel mill for the first time, going in through this, the, the, the fire stack, and he's going through the blow, you know, the, 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 the um, he's, he's basically grappled above the, um, he's on a tightrope above the, uh, the fire, uh, the, 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 the liquid magma pit or the liquid steel pit, and he's infiltrating. It was a good segment. It ended with, and actually, they didn't tell us we couldn't videotape that uh, feed. So I, put my, I brought my camera out, and I just started recording it off screen, and they never stopped me. I, um, I asked him if I could actually post that video online. I never got a response. I did eventually post it up, but it was just, I think if I posted it up the day the game came out. Again, I was not under an NDA or anything like that, but out of respect for the developers, I assumed that they wanted that footage out um, because I said, like I said, they never stopped me from videotaping it. They didn't tell us not to videotape. Um, in fact, I think I videotaped some of that panel. I, uh, honestly, I don't, I don't remember if I did. I think I just videotaped that that bit but um my favorite part of that panel was the giveaway was it ended basically after the feed was over it basically showed what looked to be the joker was dead and that batman um had found the joker he looked it up but he looked through his you know he brought up his detective mode and the joker's heartbeat was basically flat and Wow, what a cliffhanger to end it off with. The Joker, they're telling us the Joker is dead. I couldn't tell you how many Jokers I ran into over the course of the, um, of the Comic-Con telling them, you didn't make it, sir. <laughs> when they looked at me funny, I kind of said, I, I kind of made a reference like I was talking about the, um, the Joker in the Batman 1989 movie where Jack Nicholson was thrown off the building by, um, uh, Michael Keaton. Great movie, great ending, by the way. Um, so I, I basically said that, but really what I was talking about was the fact that I thought the Joker was going to die, or had died, in the game uh, in, in Arkham City. I thought that was a huge revelation. Later, of course, the game turned, and I won't, I won't, I'll talk about that in a bit. So at the very end of the panel, this is one of my favorite stories, um, at the very end of the panel, they're starting to do the giveaway. Now, the rules of the giveaway were they were giving away a few things. They were giving away a couple of soundtracks to the game, uh, which, like I said, was included as, but they were physical copies of the soundtrack on CD. Um, that was one of the things they had given away. The big prize that they, they had also given away some controllers. Uh, the big prize they were giving away, however, was this custom Xbox 360, which had the graphics on it of the um, 
from the Batman art style, which was in like the black and white Joker and a black and white Batman. If you've looked really close at like the art uh, from the from like the Batman uh, covers and stuff like that for the uh, collector's edition. It's, it was in that style. It was very much in that style. And also, I think they used that style in some of the early wallpapers. Great style. Don't get me wrong. Fantastic style. Great artwork. Um, so, here they were giving away a custom Xbox 360. Now, the, the way the panel was, or the table that the panel was at, was, design, was laid out. The Xbox 360 just so happened to be in front of Kevin Conroy. Now... Kevin is a really nice guy, and basically, I guess you know, to 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 help people out so they could see it better, he he, you know, when they were talking about okay, for you know, the first giveaway is the, the CDs. Check under your seats. If you find the CD under your seat, you've got it. You know, take it home with you. Of course, they didn't win that. Um, the second thing they were giving away were the controllers. They had tickets underneath the um, you know anybody who had the ticket basically could was a winner basically. So that was the second thing. Um, the third thing. Was the was I believe the console itself? Now to basically give the audience a better a better look at the console, Kevin picked it up and he held it you know he held it up a little bit. Now when they said okay the third thing up is this Xbox 360, so of course like with anything it got a little applause. When Kevin Conroy picked it up to give people a better showing, the applause got louder. <laughs> Because the fans were basically insinuating, I guess, that the fact that Kevin touched it gave it more value. <laughs> Kevin basically being urged on. Kevin never turned, you know, from what I know about Kevin, from what he said about for in interviews and stuff like that, he doesn't back down from that sort of stuff. Or from at least a little encouragement. He'll, he'll say, I am Batman or something like that. He's not against that. Um... If you recognize him or if you say hi, you know, in a convention or something like that, uh, he's not, you know, he's not against, he's not against that. And he held up the, when he was, when he heard the people cheering on louder, the fact that he was, you know, holding this up, he started like, <laughs> you know, touching it more and more, basically getting his hands all over it. And that just made the crowd go even crazier. <laughs> I think he almost licked it, if I remember correctly. It was a fun, it was a fun little moment. Again, I didn't win the 360. I went to another person, but I thought that was a great moment. So obviously by that point, the game was getting ready to be released, and uh, it was ready to come out. Um, my store had a midnight release for it. They were doing a uh, giveaway for Batman figurines, I think plus a couple of graphic novels. I didn't win anything because I never win anything. Um, but, um, they did give out t-shirts, which you probably see me wear in some of the videos. That's where basically I got it with pre-ordering the game. Um, I don't remember any posters being given out or anything like that. I remember, uh, picking up the, um, the collector's edition. I couldn't get it on the 360. I, I think I wanted it on the 360. I'm not, I mean, not on the 360, on the PS3. Uh, just because there was nothing special about the PS3 version over the Xbox 360 version or PC version, basically. But um, it's not as far as I, I knew. But um, so it really didn't matter which version I picked up. There were two reasons why. It was basically because I had the first game on the PS3, and the other reason was uh, it was basically just a continuity thing. The other reason was, I think that there was a Sinestro Corps Batman skin going around for anybody that was picking up Green Lantern on Blu-ray, but it was only the PS3 version of Sinestro Corps Batman. Now, the Green Lantern movie was terrible, absolutely awful, and I guess I, you know, when I picked up the, I, I, they basically ran out of copies of the, of the PS3 edition in pre-order for the collector's edition, so I picked up the 360 version. They had plenty of copies of that, so I picked that up instead. Again, no complaints. The PS3 ver I'm sorry, the Xbox 360 version of the game was fine. All the DLC codes worked. I got all the extra DLC missions. Um, they later released more of them. A lot of those went through pre-order. Um... There were the Robin missions. Those only went to Best Buy. It, basically, they spread out all of the extra content. Uh, to a bunch of different retailers. I think Amazon had their own stuff. Best Buy certainly had their own. They got the Robin uh, challenge maps. And, um, and that was basically it. That annoyed me. That rubbed me the wrong way. I don't like when retailers do that. I really don't. If you're going to split your content amongst multiple retailers, then at the very least have the decency to... Um, how do I put this? 
release all of your content through a service like Xbox Live or PlayStation Market or PlayStation Store. Don't um, if you, otherwise just stick to one retailer because there have been a lot of retailers that um, that will split out their stuff. Like for example, um, recently with uh, Metal Gear Rising, which had you know each retailer pretty much had their own Raiden skins, and that extra content has not been released to any of the downloadable content, at least not up to the time of this uh, podcast being recorded. Why not? It's kind of stupid, you think. They've done it also with other retailers. In some cases, they do. I think they did um, eventually release all that extra content online, as well as through the Game of the Year edition, which I'll talk about in a bit. But, um, yeah, there was all that. And, again, I don't, I don't agree with that. Either have one retailer have your stuff or release your stuff online, basically. So the game comes out, and of course, spoilers, this is like the most phenomenal game anybody's ever seen. Um, it took the Arkham Asylum formula and basically made it work on a fuller, large scale. It was everything I could have possibly wished it could be and more. It was a great game all around. Again, I don't really want to say too much about what happened. Needless to say... Um, Bad things do happen. I turned out to be wrong on my assumptions from the previews that I had seen. Um, and, and, but basically, it was all around a great game to play. Uh, shortly after the game comes out, um, people are starting to talk about DLC and things like that. The Nightwing DLC is released. Um, they eventually start working on the other DLC for the other, you know, for other areas and stuff like that. They release the costumes. And then they start talking about what's going to be the next big chapter of the game that they're going to release it as DLC, which is called Harley Quinn's Revenge. This was a big release because it was released to coincide with... First off, it was going to be a continuation of the first game, of the second game's story. So you have a little bit of like a postscript after that, like an epilogue, if you will. Second thing they said it was going to be playable Robin. Cool there. The third thing was was that this was going to be released alongside a Game of the Year edition for Arkham City. That's when I got interested because it's always cheaper if they do these Game of the Year edition releases to just rebuy a game that's being re-released as a Game of the Year edition than to buy all the DLC that comes out for it. I am not even joking. The DLC by that point had gotten so crazy in cost that it was actually cheaper to spend $40 rebuying the game with all of its DLC than it was to buy all the DLC through Xbox Live Marketplace or Sony or, or PlayStation Store. Now, the Harley Quinn's Revenge, I really don't want to talk about it because again, spoilers. I don't want to I don't want to discuss spoilers or anything like that. Needless to say, Harley Quinn was in it and she wanted revenge against Batman and Robin and everybody for what happened at the end of Arkham City. I remembered playing it and thinking it seemed like there was more to it. It seemed like there was going to be more to follow it, but there wasn't. That's all they ever released for it. And then at last year's E3, E3 2012, during the Nintendo press conference, the last thing we would have expected um, any Batman announcements to happen, Nintendo shows off the Wii U, which was coming out later that year, and one of the early titles that they showed was a brand new version of Arkham City, dubbed the Armored Edition. Now, for those of you guys who visit my website and or my YouTube channel on a regular basis know that I actually did uh, pick up a Wii U at launch, and one of the Three games I picked up for the, the Wii U launch uh, was Nintendo Land, which came with my Wii U. Um, what was the other one? Zombie U from Ubisoft, which was the, supposed to be the big third-party killer app. And um, the third was the Batman Arkham City Armored Edition. I really liked where they were going with this. I liked how the first stuff that they had shown for the Armored Edition when they announced it was the new forms of, the new controls that they could do with the Wii U. Um, as well as the new appearance of the Batskin uh, suit as, and, and Catwoman's suit, the new appearances of the suits and the new capabilities that you'll have with these improved suits. It looked great. So I immediately wanted to get signed up for picking those up. And I figured that 
there was no point to buying the Game of the Year edition or re, I mean rebuying the Game of the Year edition on the platforms if I was just going to pick up the Armored Edition. It looked like that if there was going to be a definitive version release for Arm, for Arkham City, it was going to be the Wii U version. And I was fine with that. That didn't seem like too much of an issue. So I pick up I pick up the Wii U day and date. Uh, and uh, I get it early in the morning. I'm, I start setting it up after I got everything all taken care of for the unboxings and everything else. And if, for those of you who are interested, you can check out my YouTube channel for the unboxings. Um, basically, what happened is is that uh, I realized as I started looking at my selection of games, that's it. I really needed to pick up Arkham City. I really wanted to. So I did. And... Um, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but Princess Angel's father is an enormous Batman fan. And um, I was worried I was going to make him jealous by picking it up. <laughs> but, I mean, I loved Arkham City, the original version of Arkham City, and I was really happy to pick up the Wii U version. That had problems. Um, Arkham City Armored Edition definitely had problems. It was buggy. It crashed a few times. It, it slowed down a few times. It had nowhere near the performance or the seamlessness of like the Xbox 360 did. I don't know what the PS3 version's uh, performance was like, but it definitely had better. It didn't have as good a performance as the 360 version did. I didn't know if that was uh, problems with the game code or problems with the, with the Wii U, or maybe that would be fixed in a system update or a firmware update or something like that. But I can tell you this. They never, up to this point of posting, released a patch for uh, Arkham City Armored Edition. And I noticed a really, really glaring bug in that um, after you play Harley Quinn's Revenge the first time, if you don't get all the balloons, then the second time you play, if you try to get the balloons, it resets the game back to the menu. I have no idea why. And they never fixed it. It's still a bug. They never patched the game. Um, there haven't been too many firmware updates since the, since the system came out, but with the most recent version up to the point I'm just writing, that's still an issue. Also, I noticed the performance wasn't nearly as good. That having been said, I really liked the back computer controls. I really liked um, the enhanced capabilities. It, I mean, I felt like Batman playing that. I just wish the game had had a bit more polish to it. Or... I wish that uh, he, WB or Rocksteady would actually patch the game um, because it's, I mean, that bug I just described in Harley Quinn's Revenge is a pretty glaring one. And I wish that they had, I wish that that obviously had been fixed. Also, like I said, it did do a hard system crash at one point. Um, the, P, uh, the Wii U is fine. I haven't had any other major crashes and stuff like that. It was just in that game. Um, I have read on their forums briefly. It looked like the people were complaining the game was buggy, but then again, I mean, people have complained about Zombie U and stuff like that. I don't know. Is it the definitive version of Arkham City? Absolutely. I just wish that it was a work uh, a better. I just wish that it worked better. I mean, you could just imagine that this could probably be fixed in a single patch. I just don't know why they're not patching it. I, I mean, it, it's just, I mean, I can understand that it just is expensive to patch, but this game does have some glaring bugs. It has performance issues in some spots, and it does have some pretty glaring bugs, especially, like I said, that Harley Quinn's Revenge uh, bug. So, that alone would probably make the game worth patching, or should overwrite the costs of patching. I understand that it doesn't make business sense to patch unless you absolutely have to, but this game needs to be patched. So... There you have it, guys. Um, that's the end of, of basically my story of Arkham City. What's next? Well, for those of you who don't know, there's a third game that's coming for the Arkham Asylum series, and it's called Arkham Origins. It's going to be a prequel story to, uh, that takes place in Gotham with Batman, with Batman fighting on Christmas Eve. As far as we know, for um, characters that have been confirmed, Slade has been confirmed, and not much else. If you're going to do Slade, I don't have a problem with that at all, but please try to get Ron Perlman to do the voice. Um, Ron Perlman, at least the guy who sounded exactly like Ron Perlman, um, did Slade's voice in the Teen Titans series, in which Slade was like pretty much the big baddie of that series on, uh, on uh, Cartoon Network. I was a... Fan of watching that series for through its first season, 
I didn't really watch it too much after that, but it was a, I thought I liked it for the first season. And um Slade was a regular baddie and um and I think he was voiced by Ron Perlman. Ron Perlman does a lot of voiceover work. He was most recently I think the voice of Sinestro in the Green Lantern animated series and I thought he was a, that was a pretty good choice. Um he's also done, you know, plenty of other evil characters and stuff like that. So my my advice to Ark uh to the guys developing uh Arkham Origins, if you're going to do Slade, which is fine, try to get Ron Perlman to do the voice because I think he's I mean, it's kind of, to me, basically the same as kind of getting, um, you know, Mark Hamill to do the Joker voice. For me, the voice is kind of like a Ron Perlman, is Ron Perlman. So, just an idea, throwing that out there. You know, they might be going for something different, a different type of slate, but I think Ron Perlman could bring it. I really do. Really looking forward to this game. Um, obviously, Rocksteady can definitely hit it out of the park. They've proven themselves uh, twice that they can definitely deliver for a Batman experience. And um, I am I think that this game is probably going to be a day one purchase for me. So there you have it, guys. That's the Batman series. I hope you enjoyed the podcast coming up next from GameAccess.net. Bioshock. <laughs> I just realized... I've not done a Bioshock podcast yet, at least not as far as my knowledge, and that's something that should be rectified. So coming up next for you guys, it looks like it's going to be a Bioshock, uh, Bioshock podcast. So until next time, guys, this is Maniac with GameAccess.net, over and out.